So I'm having to do this over again. Uh, the first time it didn't record my voice if well, I was at church. So Today we're talking about Matthew chapter 15 verses 1 through 20. 15 verses 1 through 20 is called defilement comes from within. Let's read. Then the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, Why do your disciples transgress the traditions of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. He answered and said to them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and mother. And who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, Whosoever says to his father or mother, What profit you might have received from me is a gift to God. Then he needs not to honor his father or mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesize about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching a doctrine as doctrines the commandments of men. When he had called the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear and understand, not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. Then his disciples came and said to him, Do you know the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. Then Peter answered and said to him, Explain to us this parable. So Jesus said, Are you still without understanding? Do you not yet understand whatever enters, in, enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? But those things which proceed out of the mouth comes from the heart, they, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulterers, fornicators, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemes. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. So, as we see in the first two verses, or really in the first verse, you know, it says the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, you know, a lot of people would think, wow, you know, they come all the way from Jerusalem to see Jesus out here. And you know, if you remember, he was in the land of Gennesaret, where the people just needed to touch his hem of his garment. You know, it says, and many were, many that has touched it were made perfectly well. Now, the religious leaders, like I said, come all the way, but not, it wasn't a friendly visit, but they came there to criticize him. You know, the next thing they said is, why do your disciples transgress the traditions of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. You know, one of the things, if you look, that was tradition. When you look at tradition, you start to see that, you know, not everything is always, you know, it's, it's like first it becomes a habit. Then, you know, a habit becomes like a law, a rule, you know, and, and then it becomes tradition. It's all the time. You have to do it certain ways. You know... I was kind of curious 
what is this, uh, you know, eating, washing, you know, eating bread? One of the things that I will say is it wasn't just a sanitary. You know, you wash your hands and lather it up, and it was just a sanitary thing. It wasn't that. For, you know, if you look in Mark, you'll actually see a little bit more to it. It says, Mark chapter 7, this is the parallel to Matthew 15. And so, Mark chapter 7, verses 2 and 3, it says, Now, when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding to the tradition of the elders. So what is this tradition in this holding to this tradition of the elders? You know, I, I got to, to looking and I come across this website. And it's a Jewish website. It's called Chabad.org, right? And it was an, actually an article. It says, Why We Wash Before Bread. And so let me just read this to you and give you an idea. I mean, why their tradition, why they may believe that. They say the Torah commands us to separate a small percentage of wheat, wine, and oil we produce and give it as a gift to the Kohen, the priest, called the Truma. This separate portion is holy and may not become impure. And since people tend to fidget and touch all kinds of things unknowingly, these sages, sages declare that by default, hands have a minor degree of impurity. The Kohen, which would have been again the priest, must therefore wash his hands before partaking of the Terma. Biblically, the Terma is to be taken from grain, wine, and oil. Now, the wine and oil are used, you are usually handled in vessels and not touched directly with one's hands. So it was never necessary to wash hands before they consumed them. Grain, however, is usually eaten in a form of bread, so the rabbis require washing one's hands before eating bread. The sages did not want to differentiate between different kinds of people, the Kohenes and the Israelites, nor between breads, the Turmas or and ordinary bread. So they instituted hand washing before any kind of bread, thus ensuring that the Kohen would never eat his Turim without washing. So... Additionally, they said the sages of the Tomed find support for washing bread, washing before bread, in the following verse. You shall sanctify yourselves and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. They expound this and say you shall sanctify yourselves, which refers to washing before eating, and be holy. This refers to washing after eating. Washing before bread is so important, the sages say, that it neglects and can lead to poverty or worse. So, that verse would be, I guess, a Leviticus. You know, when I look it up, that, that verse, it says, For I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore consecrate yourselves, and you shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves with anything that creepeth on earth. You know, it, it's really it's really bad, sad because they basically put washing hands before God. And I actually even heard when I was uh, studying John MacArthur, one of the things he said about it is that the the worst, you know, not not necessarily where I'm reading here where it says the worst, but that they would actually believe that by washing your hands, you gain eternal life you know 
by doing what God, you know, has said right here. I mean, they, that's not anywhere written that you have to do the certain washing of hands. Not saying that washing hands isn't a good thing before we eat, but that's a cleanliness. And this isn't cleanliness. This is more of a, you know, ceremonial issue that they were dealing with. To start with, the Bible commands the priest to do this, not everybody. So they just add on, add on, and add on. You know, I actually also heard that it was like 30 chapters just on washing hands alone. So, you know, it reminds you of that part where, you know, they'll strain at a gnat, but then swallow a camel. And, and so, you know, that they're, they're, they're swallowing this camel, trying to make somebody do things that's so crazy but then at the same time, they're not uh, willing to do those things themselves. All right, so as you see, then and now, it refers to a ceremonial cleansing and shows an outward appearance of cleanliness. Many people today are also concerned more about an outward appearance of holiness, cleanliness, you know, or something like that. What we learn... What we will learn, though, here in this, in this section is that God is concerned about your heart and not about the outside, but on the inside. You know, they turned the outside into so many things. They turned it into so much that in Isaiah, Isaiah said, bring no more. You know, Isaiah said that the Lord said, bring no more of your fruitful sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity. And these sacred meetings, your new moons and your appointed feast, my soul hates. They are trouble to me, and I am wary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. And it goes on to talk about this. But you know, one of the things that it was most important that if you catch out of this verse, it wasn't that they weren't doing the, the, the outward appearances of things, but that they weren't doing the inward parts. He says, I cannot endure iniquity. He can't endure it. He hates the iniquity. That's lawlessness. He hates lawlessness. He doesn't like it. It's what's inside your heart. That's what produces. And so he's concerned about what the heart, what comes out of you, of your heart, not what goes in your body or what festivals you keep or what anything he cares about inside you know when we look at chapter verse 3 we also see that he said he answers and said to them why do you also transgress the commandment of god because of your tradition see he answered a question with a question right there he was trying to get them to think oh, why you know why do they you know wanting to, to basically saying that they're they are going against the commandments because of their tradition. You know, one of the things we're learning about traditions, you know, where did these traditions come from? You know, uh, they were handed down. You know, I, I was uh, uh, reading Warren Wearsby's, you know, Bible exposition commentary. And he actually says, where did these traditions come from? And they were handed down from teachers of previous generations. These traditions were Originally, the oral law, oral law, which said the rabbis, Moses gave to the elders, and they passed down to the nations. This oral law was finally written down and became the Mishnah. Unfortunately, the Mishnah became more important and more authoritative than the original law of Moses. You know, And that goes to show you right there, they were... You know, earlier they they were like, it, it wasn't even in the law 
it was the priest that was supposed to wash their hands. And that was signifying the cleansing of the heart. So, you know, can you think of some of the traditions that, that you know, we do today that's not in the Bible? You know, several of them, I, I mean, I, there's several traditions I can, I can see, you know, and, and I see that we do. One of them, though, is, you know, the clerical vestments. You know, when you ever thought about the attire that's worn by clergy members, such as robes and strolls and, and you know, mitres, emitters is not that's not described in detail in the bible specific vestments especially for the church it doesn't talk about all the the hats and different things that uh, uh, different people different denominations wear you know it is uh it's something that you know is not in there and, and i haven't seen that now I did see some of the older Old Testament in the laws they they had garments but that was the Old Testament and this is the new so and it didn't say we needed to start dressing up in certain fashions wearing uh breastplates of stuff our our breastplates is a breastplate of righteousness and a belt of truth and a sh uh, shield of uh, of of salvation or a helmet of salvation and uh, you know so you know the sword of truth you know i mean you you gotta uh that's that's what we wear to wear today which is put on and actually read that bible you know talking about traditions i heard a good story you know uh the other day about tradition there was this woman and she was teaching her daughter how to cook a pot roast and as she was cooking you know preparing the food and preparing the roast up at the end she cuts off the both ends of the of the roast and and she cuts them off just so much off and she puts them to the side and the daughter asks her says why did you cut those ends off she says i i don't know we'll have to ask mother mama taught me how to do that and that's what we've always done i i never thought of asking her so she went to her mother and she's called they could both called their mother up and they called them on the phone and their mother sit there and you know she said mama why do you cut the ends off the pot roast you know what was the purpose for that is it for juices or is it for something to get more you know juices to flow inside or or, or what is it about and she's you know, mama said i I'm not really sure. I've just always done that. My mama taught me that way too. So then she turned around. As she was doing that, she turned around and she called her grandmother. And her grandmother was sitting there and she says, you know, really, really, a great grandmother was really, really old. And she says, she says, Mama, why, why did you teach us to cut the ends off the roast? The, you know, my daughter and granddaughter are asking, they're curious. She said, well, darling, I just didn't have enough room in my pot. So I needed to cut the ends off of it so it would fit in the pot. And so that's a typical <laughs> tradition that happens a lot of times. It was something that, you know, for whatever reason it was, it became a, a have to and it just passed on down to generations. You know, we look at the next verse and we'll start to see Matthew, you know, verse four and four through six. It says, "For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, Whosoever says to his father or mother, Whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift to God, then he need not to honor his father or mother." Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. You know, looking at the parallel and what exactly that's saying, this may help explain that even more. We look in Mark chapter 7, verse 10 through 13. This is the parallel part. And I did it in the uh, English Standard Version because it maybe just explains a little bit better. It says, For Moses said, 
Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corbin, that is, given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and many such things you do. So basically what they were doing was calling stuff Corbin, right? They were saying, you know, if you kind of put it, look at it this way, they were saying, this is a gift from God to God, you know, so you can't touch it. Or anything that you may have gained from me, it goes directly straight to God. So you can't gain this. You, I can't do anything for you because it's a gift. Or whatever it may be. You know, in, in a way, it's a lot like saying, I'm not really wanting to help you out and and help you much because, hey, it, I want to keep it for myself. And they use that. See, that's an outward appearance. They would say, Oh, that's a gift, get, you know, it's given to God. You, you can't touch that. That's holy. I've given that portion. And then, so I don't have anything else left to give you because I've given it all to God. You see, that's an outward. And really, you know, they, 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 they held it back, you know. And this is what he's saying. He says they do many such things like that. You know, it says that he pointed out that they, uh, John Wolverd, said that he pointed out that they controverted, controverted the scriptures in their honor of father or and mother and their allowance that the child could declare something a gift or dedicated it to God. And by this means free himself of the obligation to care for his parents. Jesus summarized this, thus have... Ye made the commandment of God none effect by your tradition. Tradition mess up a lot of stuff, won't it? I mean, it just really will. I mean, it will get you every time. So, now we go into empty religion. Empty religion. You know, uh, this is, a, and, I, and I got to looking up empty religion and found this. It says, this is a religion that doesn't mean anything to the person who claims to practice it. These people are going through motions for some reason, but there is no meaning to it. Maybe they do it to please others or other people, or maybe they do it, you know, for potluck fellowship. Whatever the reason might be, this religion is worthless to them. It's just empty. You know, and, and, I, and I put that there on, on that sense because... What's the very next word he says? He says, hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You know, when you look up the word hypocrites in the Strong's, what you find is called hip. Hypocrites, hypocrites, and it's it's an actor under an assumed character. You know, a, a a dissembler, a hypocrite. You know, one who answers, an interpreter, an actor, stage player, a dissembler, a pretender, a hypocrite. And that's the definition, basically, what it is. So, you know. When I when I think about this, you know, can you see now where Jesus is showing them that their that that their ceremonial washing of hands was just an act, just to, they were just playing the part, right? They weren't really meaning to honor God. It was just like you know, just like the 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 the, the child calling their stuff. Oh, it's dedicated to God. Oh, this is dedicated to the Lord, dedicated to God. You can't use it. You know, they were they they were pretending 
It wasn't really dedicated to God, nor were they washing their hands because of that. There was an outward appearance, a way of trying to look holy, you know, but inside their hearts, it was terrible. You know, like I said, it was a way not to live up to their obligations to their parents and be greedy and they keep it for themselves. You know, when you think of this and you look at look at hypocrites and you look at the 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 people today. You know, how many people have you ever heard say, I'm not going to church because there's hypocrites in the church. I'm a Christian. I don't have a need to go to church. You know, I've heard that a lot of times because they'll sit there and say, I'm not going to church because there's a bunch of hypocrites up there. You know, well, here's the whole thing. You know, think of all the many people that call themselves Christians today, but how many of them do you actually, would you call them Christ followers? You know, I mean, these same Christians, a lot of times when you, when you go and you, and you're, you're there and you talk to them, you'll, they'll get offended when they want to, they'll get offended by, by, by the Bible. They don't want to hear the word of God. They don't want to hear somebody talking about the Lord. They, they, they say they're holy and they do what they do, but they don't want to hear about what the Lord says or what God says, you know. And so, you know, when you look at that today, you can actually see people pretending to be Christians because of the culture. But they really aren't. They're not Christians. They're not Christ followers. If they were Christ followers, they would they would have this desire to want. I mean, they may not do what they want to do. You know, you know, Paul himself said to us that Though I do what I don't want, I don't do what I want to do, and I do what I don't want to do. He said, you know, he was wretched man that he was because, yeah, it, it, it's, it, there's times when you don't feel like doing things, but there's also the Word of God, and you're supposed to, you know, obey the Word of God. You're supposed to listen to Him and be a Christ follower, not just, you know, call yourselves a Christian. You know, it also reminds me of that part in the Bible, you know, when we just talked about it a couple of weeks ago. Uh, you know, when we were talking about the one who receives. You remember you remember the the four parts of the you know, the when the seeds were sowed and the and and who sowed them? You know, it was the son of man that sowed them. And who who he sowed them out here and he sowed them on all these different places. And you remember the one that says the seed that was sown on stony places. This is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation and persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles or, you know, he's offended. You know, a lot of people, when they start having the word, stuff about the word, somebody start you know, persecuting them, saying, oh, you believe in the Bible, huh? You know, they get, they're like, oh man, I'm, I'm kind of offended about this and I, don't, I, I just don't want to talk about this no more. So they don't want to talk about it, you know? Let's look at uh, the next couple of verses, 10 and 11. It says, when he had called the multitude to himself, he said to them, hear and understand not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth defiles a man. You know, that verse right there reminds me, you know, a couple of weeks ago we was talking about what comes out defiles a man. Out of the heart, you remember, you know, all kinds of things that defile a man. And uh, he basically, you know, we was listening to, uh, well, not listening to, but I quoted J. Vernon McGee. And what he said about that. And he says, what is in the well of the heart comes out through the bucket of the mouth. And that's so true. It's about what's coming out. And that's what Jesus is talking about right here. It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles a man. You know, it's in your heart and your mouth will speak it. You, you'll just say it. You know, Titus Verses 1, 15 and 16, I mean, chapter 1, 15 and 16, verses 15 and 16, says, 
to the pure. All things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even the mind and the conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but in, but in works they deny Him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. This goes back a couple, just what I just said a few minutes ago. You know, they profess to know God. They call themselves Christians. You know, but are they really Christ followers? You know, in their works, they don't even want to come to church. They just did, I, I don't have to go to church to, to do that. Or, or not, not necessarily church. Or I ain't got to do, you know, read the Bible to be a Christian. I, I know a lot of Christians, that, and people that call themselves Christians, who they, don't, they can't tell you a verse, John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. They don't even know that verse. But see, the culture, they, they believe they're a Christian by the culture. They're like a Christian by default. And, uh, you know, that's many people out there. And it reminds me of this other verse that, that comes to my mind where Jesus says, Many in that day will say unto me, Lord, Lord, haven't we done all these mighty works in your name and prophesied and cast out demons and done all these great mighty things in your name? And Jesus says to them, Depart from me, you worker of iniquity, for I never knew you. Boy, what a frightful, terrible thing that would be to hear them words. That would be horrible. I hope, I hope none of us ever hear those words. None of us. Anybody who ever listens to this or any of the church, none of us. That would be horrible. Now let's, let's look at verse 12. It says, Then his disciples came to him and saying and said to him, came and said to him, Do you know the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? <laughs> well, you know, wow, you know, of course he did. <laughs> he knew. <laughs> and his his answer, you know, if you actually look at his answer, it was like, Oh well. It's okay. That you know, oh well, who you know, really like who cares that they they were offended. In fact, I believe Jesus wanted them to be offended because of it. He wanted them to think about the things they were saying. He wanted things to come confront things, to confront the, you know, the, he, he was the best one to ever confront out of all the different prophets and all the different people that God has ever worked through. You know, Jesus himself, he had to come and do it himself. And, and and he wasn't playing around. He wasn't playing. He had a mission to do, but he wasn't playing around. And that's why we have his word today. Here's, here's what his answer was. Here's what he said. He says, you know, when we look at 13 and 14, he says, but he answered and said, every plant my heavenly father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. Here's, you see what he's saying? Let them. This is why I said, oh, well. Let them alone. Leave them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both of them will fall into the ditch. So he's letting you know. You know, you better watch who you follow, who you study after, who you listen to. You know, because if they're blind and they don't see the Word of God, and they're not speaking what God's saying, then they're blind. And if you're blind and you can't see it, then guess what happens? Both of you fall into the ditch. Like I said again, I hope, I hope nobody goes into that part. Nobody falls into the ditch. Be careful. The Bible says there's wolves in sheep's clothing. You know, ravaging wolves. You know, Paul said he cried... Day and night for three years pleaded, you know, that there would be people come in after he lived. You know, that you, you just really, really be careful. Read your word. Read the word of God. You know, that's the most important thing. You know, when I sit here and look at him, he's sitting there saying that his father 
you know, he says, every plant which my father has planted, has not planted. You know, every plant which my father, heavenly father, has not planted will be uprooted. Well, do you remember this part? We were just talking about the parable of the tares, you know, and and, and, and the, the parable of the sower. You know, we, we look at, he was the sower, right? He's the He was the one that was sowing. But the parable of the tares. So let's look, read Matthew. Go back and just remember Matthew chapter 13, verses 36 through 43. And it says there, and it says, Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares in the field. And he answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. But the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and gather them, and will and, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into a fiery a furnace of fire. There will be welling and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear. Let him hear. You know, when you look at that, I mean, one of the first thing is he's sitting there saying that he who sows the seed is the good seed, is the son of man. Down here, two chapters later, he says, every plant which my heavenly father has not planted. So, you know, when I look at that, that's that's a part of him being equal with God. You know, the father. He, the son is equal with the father. They're both planting seeds, but they're, you know, that shows that they are the one in the same too also. And then he says they'll be uprooted. You know, we look at it, it's the angels or the reapers, and they'll be uprooted when they're gathered. You know, he said, let them alone. He said, let them alone, you know. So when we we look at all of this, we see those things there. Now we come to the matters of the heart. Matters of the heart. You know, when I look at Proverbs, it's Proverbs 4.23. It says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Everything you do. That's what God was trying to get to. You know, we read the next verses, 15 through 17, and it says, Then Peter answered and said to him, Explain this parable to us. So Jesus said, Are you still without understanding? Do you not yet understand that whatever enters into the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? You know, looking at at the parallel again, which would be Mark chapter 7, verses 18 and 19, you know, it actually says, Jesus says, so he said to them, his disciples, are you thus without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from the outside cannot defile him because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach and is eliminated, purifying all foods? Wow. You know, Peter uh I think Peter, you know, I thank God for Peter, to be honest with you, uh, and, and all his disciples, because if you see how hard of a time they had trying to understand the words of God and, and the things they had a hard time with, and then later on shared with us, you can even see, I think it was in Acts somewhere where he had to go to uh, another man's house and, and sit and eat, and he said, never, Lord, I can't go into a a house with a, a a Gentile's house. And and he said, you know, you, you not only do that, but I clean it. See, he, he right here said it to him here again earlier while he was still there. 
So, but one of the main things he's trying to say not wasn't about the food, but what comes out of the heart. It doesn't defile you because it doesn't go into the heart. What it goes into is the stomach. You know? And he's Jesus right here is trying to show you it's a matter of the heart. Everything is about the heart. What comes out of the heart. You know, and is what he says comes out of that heart. He says, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, then they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murderers, adulteries, fornicators, fornications, thefts, blas- false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. You know, that if if you just remember, if you look back at the story of David when he had a problem with Bathsheba, you can see every one of these sins, these things that proceeded from David's heart, right? And you can see those things that come out of them. Now, this was David's heart. He says... He was one God said that seek that and you wanted a heart just like him, right? And just like God. And so what what did it one of the things that David is is attributed to David is Psalms 51. You know, when he did confess and repent of his sins with Bathsheba. He sat there and he says Psalms 51:10 was created to me a clean heart. O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. You know, when you actually look at this right here, you look at this, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts. You know, first thing that David did was he was up on that roof of the palace, you know, where he was at. He was up on the roof and he looked down and he said he saw Bathsheba, you know, I guess on top of her roof. And, and he had an evil thought. His thoughts were going through. Then what did he do? You know, when it says evil thought murders, he went and and actually had her husband killed, sent off to battle, you know, put on the front lines, make sure he dies, telling his people to put him where the arrows were actually hitting. And that was a murder. That was on his his hands. Adulteries. He, He... not only did he look at Bathsheba and lust after her, he ended up committing adultery with her. Fornications, I mean, that's all has to do with adultery. You know, the same thing. He was, fornic- you know, doing that. Thefts, well, he stole her from a man. You remember, do you remember the story of the lamb? You know, there was the lamb, the little lamb, the little wee lamb that the man, the poor man, Sit there and he loved so much he thought of it as his own daughter. And yet here was this rich man that turned around and came and 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 took that little lamb and and fed it to the the guest, the the people, the strangers that were come in. You know, that's what he said. And you remember David's response was, Well, that man needs to restore four times. See, David knew the law. He needs to restore four times what he, and then be put to death. See, David, and then and then Nathaniel. I think it was Nathaniel sit there and said, "Oh, this person is you, King." And you see, false witnesses. So he 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 was trying to cover up murder, and he was already getting other people to cover it up. And every bit of it was a blasphemy. He was the anointed king. Oh, what a great God we have. That even when we do the very worst, he still loves us. That if we'll come to him and with a contrite spirit and ask him to create in me a clean heart and renew in me, he, he, he will do it. If you want that, he'll do it. Oh, what a wonderful God we have. So let's look at Colossians 3, 1 through 
Colossians chapter 3, 1 through 10. Cicero says that if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting, at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above and not on things of the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members which are, in, which are on the earth, fornications, uncleanliness, passions, evil desires, covenantness and and idolatries because of these things the wrath of god is coming upon the sons of disobedient in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them but now you yourselves are put off are to put off these all these things all these anger wrath malice blasphemies filthy languages Out of your mouth. Do not lie one to another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created him. So when you think about that, see, here she goes a whole nother list fornications, uncleanliness, passions. We're to put those things away. We don't have them come out of our mouth. It says, put away the anger, the wrath, the malice, the blasphemy, the filthy language out of your mouth. Don't have those things come back. That that right there shows us that as Christians, we can fail. But heaven forbid we fail and become, you know, that we, heaven forbid we fail. Not that we become sons of disobedience, but that we never actually, we just call ourselves a Christian, but never change those things, that those things never change. That we retain God in our knowledge, but we desire not to have any part of Him. The Lord is wonderful. I will say that. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just come to you today and I just thank you for everything you've done for me, Lord, everything you've done for the church, everything you've done for each and every one of us, Lord, that you would teach us with your word, Father, that you would just create in us a new heart, you know, create in us that heart that you want. Not only create it, but renew our spirit, Lord, to renew a right spirit in ourselves. Not just any spirit, but a right spirit. Lord, that you would come and show us your word and teach it to us and help us to not only just be there and and listen to you and learn from you, but that we would take it and apply it to our day and day, daily lives, that we wouldn't let their, our mouths just spew out anger and hate and filthy language, Lord. That we wouldn't have that. When, when, when that does happen, Lord, you'd convict us. Lord, if there's anybody who doesn't know you, that isn't even, that doesn't believe, that hears this, or that doesn't hear it, Lord, may you convict them and make them to where they have no choice but to come to you. Lord, that you would use this word, your word, Lord, to convict them that convict their hearts, that they will trust in you and be saved. Lord, we love you and we praise you. We thank you for all your many things you've done for us and your gifts and your knowledge. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.